Welcome to the Attorney Post, your source for inside baseball talk about the legal field with the top attorneys in the country. Here's your host, Justin West. All righty. Hey, guys. Hello and welcome to the Attorney Post, where we discuss what's going on in the law with lawyers who are at the top of their game. In this episode, I actually am I'm delighted to say I've got Ronald Supanchek with me, uh, and uh, we're going to be discussing a lot of the different things that you need to know, the ins and outs of family law. Uh, he practices uh, family law in uh, out in California. So we're going to talk to him about uh, a lot of that stuff today. Um, but first, we do have uh, one of the ads from one of our sponsors. So I'm going to jump over here. Uh, I'm going to show you Ron's site really quickly, and I'll show you our sponsor site, and we'll keep going. So there's Ron's site, the Law Collaborative. We'll be talking with Ron here shortly. But first, we're going to talk about injuryattorneyleads.com. Personal injury attorneys spend a lot of time and money on advertising, but it's difficult to get qualified leads. You're paying for leads that are not qualified, or worse, you're getting leads from the internet that are no longer interested in talking to a lawyer if you even ever get a hold of them in the first place. These leads can average on the low end $99 a lead and on the high end $400 a lead, and you can burn through five to 10 of them just to get one serious prospective client on the phone. The solution is injuryattorneyleads.com. InjuryAttorneyLeads.com will live transfer people directly to your law firm who've been in an accident and who want to speak to a lawyer about their case. So you can be sure that these potential clients meet your criteria for a qualified lead and the close rates average 60%. Set up a time to speak with a client generation specialist by visiting InjuryAttorneyLeads.com and scheduling a time to talk. Again, that's InjuryAttorneyLeads.com. And now we're going to come back over here and we are going to start talking with you, Ron. So how are you doing today, Ron? Excellent. Awesome. Well, I am joined with Ron Supanchek, and uh, I've got a little bio here, so we'll start with that, and then we can fill it in as we need. Uh, Ron has been practicing family law exclusively since 1970, if I'm not mistaken. Uh, He was admitted to the Supreme Court of the United States in October of 75, uh, and he's been certified by the California Bar Association Board of Legal Specialization as a family law specialist since the inception of that certification program in 1980. And I don't want to make him feel old, but I just turned 40 this year and I was born in 1980. So it's been a while. (laughs) Ron has been handling hundreds of contested dissolutions, child custody cases, uh, disputed post-marital proceedings, alimony cases, and prenuptial agreements. Uh, He has served As a mediator and as a judge pro tem with the Los Angeles County Superior Court since 76, he holds an AV rating with Martindale Hubble. Uh, He's been voted one of LA's super lawyers uh, by a jury of his peers in Los Angeles every single year since 2006, if I understand correctly. Um, And he was even in a special ceremony. uh, He was honored by the State Bar of California for 30 years of service as a family law specialist. So, Ron, first questions first. Did I miss anything? (laughs) Uh, I'm a fellow in the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, and you're exactly the same age as my youngest daughter. Hey, is she a Scorpio? Was she born in November? (laughs) She was born in January. Okay, she's a little older than me then. That's all right. (laughs) Very good. Well, let's get started, and uh, we're just going to kind of talk about the ins and outs of uh, of family law and practice there in California. Uh, Speaking of family, though, first questions first, I see you actually are working with your son, Ty. Uh, How is it working with family uh, in a family practice law? Uh, Is it it the the joy you always hoped it would be? Is there sometimes you guys butt heads on cases, or how does that play out? Biggest surprise of my life that two of my four children chose to follow me into this profession. About 15 years ago, my son, who'd been in entertainment law for 20 years, called me up and said, Pop, do they still have that program in California where you can become a lawyer debt-free? And it happens to be the California Law Study Program. You can become a lawyer here uh, the same as you can uh, as Abraham Lincoln and Thomas Jefferson. You find a lawyer who's certified, qualified, in good standing, and he supervises your education while you work in the office and do all the study requirements established by the state bar. It's state bar regulated, state bar uh, overseen. And uh, it took him about five years. He had to take two bar exams. Uh, After studying torts, contracts, and criminal law, he had to take a baby bar, which was one day, and then he was able to uh, study the other 14 areas of law and sat for the big bar in 2010 and was admitted, and tears came down my eyes (laughs) standing next to him 
in the Pasadena Convention Center before the appellate district court as they swore him in as a new lawyer in California. It was, it was remarkable. So he, he was a, my paralegal for five years, and now he's been a lawyer for 10. And uh, a few years ago, his sister came to me after about 10 years in entertainment. They both had gone into entertainment law. Uh, and not, not entertainment law, but entertainment, entertainment industry. He was a personal manager. She was a singer and a performer. And uh, she said, I want to do what Ty did. And uh, I said, it's too hard. And it really was hard. Ty, the fact that he did it was remarkable. Very few people ever complete that program successfully. I think it's like 14%. But uh, so she went to law school instead. She found a local law school at night. And she's now finishing up her last year in law school, and she'll be sitting for the bar in July. Wow, that is amazing. And I know that, uh, I mean, I, I've got tons of debt. I know lots of people have tons of debt from going to go to school, going to college, et cetera. So being able to get your way through through law school uh, in, a, in an inexpensive way, even if it's a, a rigorous way, that's uh, that's a very wise move. So how is working with your son? Is he, you guys are always on the same page or does he sometimes challenge you in your decisions or how does that play out? It's a, a very interesting situation. Uh, challenges are presented, but uh, that's true in any uh, important relationship. You know, relationship, every relationship is a conversation. And that conversation is either for good or for something else. Every time you open your mouth, Justin, what comes out of your mouth is either for good or it's for something else. And so what I've worked on very hard over, uh, well, all of the years of my life is to learn how to be a better listener and a better communicator. That seems like very practical life advice. <laughs> it is. And that's what success in any profession is. It doesn't matter what profession you're in. Uh, it's all about having the right kind of conversation with the right kind of people and attracting into your life the people who add something of value and simply withdrawing from uh, those that do not, those that hurt you, those that harm you, those that uh, put you down, embarrass you, intimidate you, frighten you. What I've come to realize is that my profession is really family reorganization, helping families stay together when parents choose to part. And so about 15 years ago, about the time that Ty joined me, I changed the designation of my office. It was always the law offices of Ronald Neal and Sapanchek. We dropped that and changed it to the Law Collaborative Los Angeles because we really believe in the collaborative process working with families, working with couples, teaching communication skills, co-parenting strategies, and uh, approaches to allocation and apportionment that are fair, just, and equitable. So you guys kind of really cover the whole basis and you try and help people when they leave your office to, to be in a better position to, to manage their lives going forward. That's great. Uh, that is what is unique and extraordinary about our office is the emphasis on consensual dispute resolution. I do a seminar free uh, virtually uh, once a month and it's coming up Saturday. I'll be doing this program. Uh, this is the second Saturday of the month coming up as we speak. And uh, from 10 to 12, anybody can plug in. I talk about the seven options for divorce. There are seven ways to do divorce. And the most important or the most frequent question I get from people is, what does a divorce cost? And it's a little bit like buying a car or buying a house. How much square foot? How much horsepower? What car are you choosing? What house are you going to buy? It's the same in divorce. Which option are you going to choose? And it's important that you understand there are all these different options. 
That's the first hour of the two hour talk. And the second hour is focused on substance. We talk about children, we talk about support, we talk about asset, liability, allocation and apportionment and costs and fees. So that's what the seminar is all about. It's free, I've been doing it for 20 years and uh, I get some wonderful uh, people that uh, show up and ask amazing questions. And I don't limit it to um, people in the public. I also allow uh, professionals to attend. So I have financial specialists, real estate experts, other lawyers and mental health professionals who sit in from time to time to get an update on California family law. If people want to join those seminars, I, it looks like they can go to your website and you have a spot for education and events. Is that correct? Correct. They can sign up uh, by calling in, letting uh, the office know that they want to participate and they'll be given the information. All right. That's good to know. We'll uh, make sure that there's a link to that down below this video. I don't know if this video is going to go live before tomorrow, unfortunately, because um, that's just the way life goes sometimes. <laughs> uh, but the fact that you do this on a regular basis means people are going to be able to find that. So that's a great resource to have. And the fact that you do it very regularly means that even if people are watching this in you know a few years, that probably is still going to be an ongoing thing. So uh, you can visit again, thelawcollaborative.com. And up at the top, they have a tab that says education and events. So that's awesome. That's a great, that's a great free service and a great way to just get in front of people and, and, and provide goodness to the world. So that's wonderful. So let me ask you this front, what brought you into family law in the first place? Cause I can imagine, you know, some people, when they think of, you know, a law career, maybe they think of the, the, the criminal prosecutor, or, or you know, uh, maybe they think of the, the injury lawyer who, who gets the, the big windfalls and whatnot. Um, I imagine it takes a, a special kind of person to, to dedicate themselves to this process. So what got you into family practice? My hero, uh, before I attended law school or even thought about law school was Clarence Darrow. I uh, so admired his legal career. Abraham Lincoln was a brilliant uh, litigator, litigated, took cases all the way to the Supreme Court. And uh, Gandhi, he was a, uh, a lawyer for years before he became a civil rights activist. And um, so I admired lawyers that had these litigation skills. And uh, right out of uh, USC Law School, I went to Spray Golden Bowers, and I thought I was going to be a litigator. But uh, I uh, stayed there for about two years. My family was growing. I was never at home. I was on the freeway in the dark, coming home in the dark. Uh, my kids were not getting the benefit of my time. And so I left uh, the firm, uh, major firm on Mosier Boulevard and opened up an office in Van Nuys, which is close to the courthouse and close to where I live in the San Fernando Valley. And I uh, wound up, uh, what came in the door were divorce cases because it was a bedroom community to Los Angeles. And a lot of people in the entertainment industry and a lot of other aerospace industry. So I was getting a lot of different kinds of people and it just seemed to be more and more and more family law. And then when uh, certification came along in 1980, I'd been practicing family law for 10 years and I was doing mostly family law. So I uh, studied for that exam and became a certified family law specialist. After I'd been practicing law for about 20 years, I was having lunch with a psychotherapist who uh, asked me a question that I answered and told the story for the very first time. I'd never told this story to anyone in my life. And what I told her was, when I was nine years old, my mother took me by my shoulders in my grandmother's kitchen in Seattle and said, Ronnie, we're not going back to Long Beach. You're going to be my little man and she divorced my father, married her high school sweetheart, and my two brothers and sister and I got a new stepfather. We got adopted. We got a new name. We moved to a new parish where nobody knew our deep, dark secret of divorce. My mother had two more uh, little girls and a little boy. So I was the oldest of seven, four boys and three girls. 
And uh, I thought, well, that's what I'm supposed to do. I got stationed on a destroyer in San Diego after I got out of high school. And uh, my father was a carpenter working in Los Angeles on the Harbor Freeway. And I started visiting him from, Los, from San Diego. I'd come up on the weekends when I had leave and he'd take me polka dancing to the Croatian palace on uh, Imperial Boulevard, south end of LA. And Frankie Yankovic was hmm. uh, the, um, the polka king. Polka king. I like his son. His son <laughs> was uh, we Weird Al Yankovic. Yep. I he know exactly like, what you're talking about. He was a little kid running around the band. So I changed my name back to my birth name. I'm the only sibling that has the name of Bert and uh, stayed in LA and went to school and uh, started practicing law. And 20 years later, I'm talking to my mother on the telephone. My stepfather had contracted pancreatic cancer, was dying of cancer. She decided to join a religious order so she could uh, take care of him, be a hospice provider during his last year. He lasted two years and she was now getting ready to take her final vows of poverty, chastity, and obedience. She was going to become a novitiate in a religious order, providing hospital services. And she happened to ask me in that telephone call, how's your father? And I said, oh, he's dying. And she said, what? I said, yeah, he had a heart attack. He had a stroke. Uh, it won't last six months. She said, really? Do you think I should give him a call? They hadn't spoken in 40 years. Yeah. And uh, I said, you're not going to believe this. He moved back to Seattle. Helen threw him out and he moved in with his sister, Steffi. She's up here. <laughs> Six months later, I'm the best man. My brother gives the bride away and my parents were reunited after a 40 year hiatus. Wow. He had a battery pack. He had a defibrillator. He had a pacemaker. He looked like a bag of groceries walking around the kitchen uh, with all these bulges. He lasted 13 years more. So they <laughs> married 13 years. They were divorced for 40 years and they were married for 13 years. And I lived the fantasy of every child of divorce seeing his parents reunited. And the psychotherapist said, you're what we call in our profession, a wounded healer. You had no choice in the matter. You had to do divorce so you could make a difference for children that came within the scope of your uh, legal services. And that's what I came to realize that I'm really serving um, a higher cause when I practice family law. My goal is to help families through the process with a minimum of acrimony, animosity, uh, cost and pain. Wow. <laughs> that is one heck of a story. Um, and so now I, I, I caught almost all that. So your mother never took her final vows. Is that correct? She did Just, not. She married my father again. <laughs> oh, that he, is. He asked her one time, he said, how come we get along so well uh, now? And we couldn't get along at all before. And she said, that's easy. I had four kids to raise. Yeah. You need a full-time mother. And it's true. My father was a child of divorce. Custody was given to his father. And then his father died. He was too embarrassed to go reunite with his mother. And he wound up going on the bum, what he called it, during the Depression. He started riding the rails and, until he was 18. And then he joined a merchant marine. And so he had a, a difficult life. Um, because of his childhood. Hmm. Wow. That is, uh, that's one of the neatest stories I've heard in my entire time of uh, doing this podcast. So <laughs> I'm just kind of, kind of soaking that one in. So, all right. Now, one thing I do know, and um, kind of go off the, off the script here a little bit. Um, you know, we live in a very divorce saturated culture i think uh, i don't you probably know the stats better than i do because you deal with them on a regular basis i've heard somewhere between a third and 50 percent of, of marriages end in divorce these days um do you think that's true and, and what can people do to 
try, I mean, not that I want, you know, I'm sure you don't want less business, but at the same time, I'm sure you do, right? You, you want to see fewer families break apart. What, what do you think are the, the most important steps that someone who's considering a divorce should look at, you know, and, and you know, whether or not the divorce is going to be inevitable or, or not? Justin, there are some people you should not marry. Fair. And Justin, there are some people who should not marry you. And there are some people who should marry nobody. <laughs> There's a, there, it's a serious, serious step, and it's a serious, serious problem. I believe in premarital psychotherapy with a skillful mental health professional that can administer the 16 PF personality profile test. You need to find out if there's going to be a match. There's always going to be bumps in the road. There's always going to be difficulties. But Hitler is alive and well. Charlie Manson is still out there. There are people you should not marry, and a psychological professional a per, a, a personality profile will help detect the uh, histrionics, the sociopaths, the um, borderline personality disorders, and the narcissists. Mm -hmm. There are just some people that sh nobody should marry, and and about I you know about ten percent of the population have serious personality disorders. I've heard that. But they are mostly the ones that wind up in divorce because people that get married to them find that they're cruel, they're unconscious, they're uh, difficult to live with, to say the least. And in some cases, they have addictive personality, uh, alcohol, drugs. If you're in a marriage where it's uh, suicide on the installment basis, you need to get out. So divorce lawyers provide a real service helping families reorganize. Uh, I don't represent the alcoholics or the drug addicts. If I discover a client's a personality disorder, I find another lawyer for them. I just, I don't do well with those people. Mm -hmm. And uh, most lawyers don't, but most lawyers don't have the knowledge and the experience and the skill to find out who they are so that they can avoid them in their lives. My wife's a psychotherapist. So for years, I looked over her shoulder and I would go to continuing education programs with her. And I began becoming very aware of these kinds of problems. And so that's made a huge difference in my practice. Back in the, I don't know, 80s, there was a little circle with a bozo, the clown, and a line through it. And the uh, caption on the little sticker that people put on their bumpers were, no bozos. bozos. No bozos. Well, that's been my policy. I don't represent bozos. If you're not going to be fair, honest, ethical, uh, kind, respectful, dignified in your divorce there's lots of lawyers that will represent you i'm just not one of them and the bar professional skills of professional conduct the bar rules say you don't have to represent everybody and you should not represent people you're not comfortable representing so that's made a big difference in my practice and that's why i'm still practicing law after all these years i've really learned how to do it right i really learned how to be a service to people I really uh, am devoted and dedicated to helping families reorganize with dignity. Hmm. Well, that's good to know. That's uh, it, 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 there definitely has to be I mean, even in other fields a little bit of discernment in the people that you work with. But I can definitely understand. I've, I've had that question. I've, I've asked it of uh, criminal attorneys as well. You know, are there are some cases you just refuse to take. What, so. Uh, 
obviously there are some cases you refuse to take. Um, what is your, what's your usual client base like? What, what are your usual people who come to you? Do you deal, if it even matters or anything you catalog, do you tend to deal more with fathers or more with mothers, or do you tend to work with both sides? I don't think that happens very often, but I've heard of a few attorneys that do, or at least within their practice. So uh, what, what are your usual clients like, and, and how many cases do you personally handle at a time? Uh, how many cases does your firm also handle at a time? Just out of curiosity, but that's a later question. I have uh, two lawyers and two paralegals, and we have about 60 open files. And then we have another 10 or 20 that are in various stages of closing. Uh, of those files, there's maybe two or three that are, I call hot files, because we're in court uh, talking to judges, uh, setting hearings. But I have to tell you, Justin, this pandemic has changed the practice of law in a way that is really miraculous and inconceivable. Uh, technology has come into the practice of law. I was always limited to the San Fernando Valley. Mm -hmm. I took cases from Lancaster to Long Beach and from uh, Ventura to Pomona and it, nothing beyond that. But this now with electronic access to courts, I can take courses in San Diego. I can take cases in Sacramento, um, San Francisco, it doesn't matter. So I can take cases from anywhere in California, and that is starting to happen. We're starting to see cases from other jurisdictions where they want our services, and we can provide all of the backup and support electronically. So our practice is designed to help families in distress who are really anxious to avoid the uh, high cost of litigation and uh, embrace consensual dispute resolution. Interesting. So as actually one of the questions I had written down, uh, I don't think I read it to you in our pre-roll, um, but just in general, how, how has COVID affected your law firm? Obviously you're, you're seeing more people from, from a wider range of places. Is it affecting the way that you, you process your work on a day-to-day -day basis? And also, do you think it's causing an uptick or a downtick or is everything about the same as far as the overall caseload? Are, are, are more people because they're stuck together? Are they, are they, are, are you seeing a spike in divorces because of COVID or are you seeing basically the same or less? This has been the biggest uh, change in the practice of law in my lifetime. Wow. And I think it's for the good. Um, I was talking to another lawyer in uh, Century City who just made her first uh, electronic appearance in court. Wow. You used to charge clients portal to portal from the time you leave the office to the time you return. That was standard in family law practice. And now it's turn on the TV turn on your screen, plug into an electronic app, and boom, you're in court. So a 90 minutes drive downtown, I'm 30 miles from Central Department LA, and 40 miles from Central Department Ventura, in the west end of the San Fernando Valley. And so it takes an hour to an hour and a half to get almost anywhere. And that's billing time from the time you leave to the time you get back. That's all been eliminated. So I think access to the courts, access to justice, and the courts are becoming more streamlined. State courts don't operate like federal courts. Federal courts are very strict, but state courts, because of the technology and the limitations of technology and electronic appearances are becoming much more like the federal courts. And they're not allowing all of the nonsense and baloney that used to take place in the courtroom, it's all being recorded. So people can, you know, uh, show people what's going on. There was a lawyer recently who somebody had fooled with his computer and he came up looking like a squirrel or a mouse or something. Oh, I saw that, I think. You saw that video? <laughs> I mean, you know, it's, it's ridiculous and absurd, but everybody saw it. Yeah. And I was, you know, truly humiliated. And he was a cat. I assure you, Your Honor, I am not a cat. <laughs> Yeah, that's the one. Well, you know, so this has changed the practice of law in a remarkable, extraordinary, and good way. And uh, I'm seeing our practice uh, bloom and blossom. Uh, we're bringing in more clients, and we're doing it now all virtually. We moved our offices to our homes 
in March of 2020. Uh, at the end of 2020, I asked my staff if they wanted to go back to the office. They all said no. Uh, everybody is working from home. So we left brick and mortar permanently uh, in 2020. We didn't know it was going to be permanent, but it turns out it is. And we're not going back to brick and mortar. We're going to stay virtual. Our appearances are virtual. Our meetings with our clients are virtual. And there's plenty of people out there that will meet you at a coffee shop or a restaurant or in their office. A lot of lawyers still have offices. Yep. But what I'm surprised at is the number of lawyers who have done what I have done and the hundreds of lawyers that I've talked to who have been doing this for 20 years. I'm meeting a lot of lawyers, uh, lawyers that are immigration lawyers, lawyers that are IT lawyers. Um, they've been doing this for years. They never uh, had an office and never needed one. People uh, talk to them over the telephone. Now we have Zoom. So I think that uh, lawyers in 2030 will look back on 2020 as being the most profound change in the practice of law in their lifetime. Huh. Now, I would agree with that. I think it, I mean, definitely we've seen a radical shift in the way that lots of people are doing the jobs. I mean, I've been doing, I'm, I'm, a, I'm a digital marketer by trade. So I do a lot of video stuff in general. This isn't like new hat to me, but just seeing the way that so many people have taken what they're doing, coaches, consultants, uh, doctors, even uh, with, you can do like a zoom diagnosis now and stuff with people. Um, so here, here's a, here's a practical question for you. Um, I, I know that with doctor's offices, they've got their HIPAA and all these other requirements. They have to keep their files, et cetera. So I think seeing doctors working totally out of the home is probably not going to happen anytime soon, but as an attorney, what do you, if you work totally out of the home and you no longer have an office, how do you, and I'm just purely curious here, this is shooting from the hip, but how do you keep like your documents and stuff? Do you have like an online repository? Do you have, do you just keep them in the house? Like purely curious. And if, if I'm asking too much inside baseball uh, for you there, feel free to, to dodge the question. Oh, but no, this is a, a conversation that's quite uh, active and ongoing in uh, the legal profession among certified family law specialists, among fellows in the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, uh, study groups, everybody's talking about uh, what they're doing in their practice and we're becoming paperless. I never thought that would really happen, but we really are becoming paperless. And we're now getting rid of all the old files. We've just hired a company to turn all of our digitizer files into electronic files. So when a client leaves, uh, they get everything on a, on a little stick. flash drive. Yeah. <laughs> they, they, uh, you know, and there it is. They've got the whole thing and it's hundreds and hundreds and maybe thousands of exhibits and documents and tax returns. And it's all there, all the pleadings, everything. So that's what's happened is that we've become paperless. Uh, we're still uh, mastering the skills of electronic manipulation. Yeah. Uh, I did a seminar this morning and I did my first PowerPoint on Zoom and I fumbled and I bumbled and I had troubles with it. And uh, my colleagues all laughed, uh, but they appreciated the presentation because the content was there. Even though the presentation was a little garbled, the content was of value and they appreciated it. Now, as time goes on and I do more and more of these, I'll get better at it. And I, uh, I've got a really great um, presentation on the top 10 tips if you're considering divorce. I'm going to talk about you though. Uh, I, there we go. Sometimes I can't even talk. I'm going to talk about those with you here in a minute because uh, I'm sure you can at least give a, a hint to a couple of those tips. I'm going to ask you also, um, you know, what advice you would give for uh, people that are looking uh, to, to get a divorce. It's actually, you know what, let's, let's go there first. Um, what, what advice would you give to somebody uh, who is thinking about uh, a divorce? What, what should they keep in mind? What should they be asking of themselves? What should they be asking of their spouse? Uh, and of course, what should they be asking of their attorney or their, their potential attorney? They have to have a plan. What is the plan? They should write out a specific plan. You should have a statement, a statement of what you're going to do. What is your commitment? What kind of a divorce 
do you want to have? A mission statement for your divorce. What kind of a divorce do you want to have? How much money do you want to spend on the divorce? How long do you want that divorce to last? What kind of process are you going to choose? How many options do you have? So the first step is a written mission statement. And you shouldn't say anything to anybody. But when you're ready to talk to your spouse, you should show them the mission statement and ask them for theirs. The second thing they should do is they should write the family story. I told you my family story. Yeah. It was horrible. I didn't get to see my father uh, for years after my parents decided to divorce. But I, I, I learned to live with that and I learned to help other people by telling them some very different things. So the second thing is to write the family story. There is going to be a family story. The children will tell their children how and why grandpa and grandma got the divorce. Why don't you be the author of that story? Grandma and grandpa met in college. They fell madly in love. They had these incredible children together that they loved with all of their heart. They got distracted. They were working and moving in different directions. They became derailed and they wound up in different places where they could no longer stay together as husband and wife. But their commitment was always, first and always, their children. How do we do this in a way that does the least amount of harm to our children? So they write the family story. And then the third thing is to pick a lawyer who is skilled in the uh, strategies, tactics, and tools of consensual dispute resolution. What is that? Consensual dispute resolution says you're going to stay in charge of your divorce. You're going to make the decisions about the divorce. You're not going to give it to some former lawyer in a black dress who sits up on a chair that's a foot and a half or three feet taller than everyone else in the room. I mean, it's, it's ridiculous. The lawyer doesn't know. There used to be a lawyer in Los Angeles. He's retired now. This lawyer used to say, ladies and gentlemen, I'm not a seer. I'm not a wise man. I'm not a parenting expert. I'm not a bank. I've got nothing to give you. Every, all I can do is take things away from you. Go out in the hallway with your lawyer and your spouse and work out a settlement. Whatever you come up with will be better than what happens in here. Well, I was a very wise and honest judge. I've never heard any other judge say that, but the judges are limited to distributive bargaining. They can only take things away. They're very limited by the civil code, the code of civil procedure, the evidence code, the rules of conduct. So they can't, they're very limited lawyers who are skilled in the strategies, tactics, and tools of consensual dispute resolution can engage in collaborative bargaining. And you can do things that aren't otherwise possible. Are you familiar, Justin, with collaborative bargaining? I know the concept a little bit, but I'm sure you could probably enlighten me and our listeners a little bit more as to what goes into that. You have time for a very short story. Uh, we always this This podcast is all about the stories, so please. Father walks into the kitchen. The children are fighting over an orange. He grabs it out of their hands. He puts it on the chopping block, cuts it in half, says half to son, half to daughter. They both burst into tears. He says to his son, why are you crying? Well, I wanted the whole orange. Well, you can't have the whole orange. There's only one. You have to share it with your sister. Stop crying. Then he turns to his daughter. He says, silly, Sally, why did you... Why are you crying? And she says, Papa, I didn't want the orange at all. What? I only wanted the peeling for an icing recipe for a cake I just baked, but I have to have all of the peeling. You just want the outside of the orange? Yes. Can Johnny have the inside of the orange? Yes. Johnny, will you give her the outside for the inside? Yes. What did the father fail to do? He failed to find out what the interests of the parties were. 
This is all described and discussed in getting to yes, getting past no, difficult conversation, the uh, publications, the science, the information, the technology that has come from the Harvard program on negotiation. And uh, collaborative bargaining allows creativity and imagination not permitted in court. So lawyers who are knowledgeable, who are skillful, who are competent, caring, and work with integrity can always give the parties a better deal than the judge can. People are mistaken. They tell me all the time, I have to go to court. I have to get a judge. They think that, but it simply isn't true. I sat as a judge pro tem for a number of years in the LA County Superior Court. And I can tell you, the judges have to follow the law. They have to do what the law tells them. Do you know, Justin, when you stand at the altar and say, I do, how many rights, duties, and obligations attach to you in that instant? Um, I honestly don't. I just never, uh, obviously, I don't think anyone goes into a, a marriage planning on a divorce, but I've never even considered it from that aspect. I know that I've got you know, visitation rights if my wife gets ill and, and, and things like that. I know that anything that I create while we're married, it, should we divorce, which we don't plan on it, we're, we're Catholic, um, we, you know, would, would she would get half, I, I think Jeff Bezos just got divorced a while ago and had to give basically half of all that he had to his wife or something along those lines. So I know those little bits, but I don't, I don't have any clue about the, the total legal ramifications at all. I'm sure most people don't. 1,500 <laughs> rights, duties, and obligations in California. If you haven't written a premarital agreement with your spouse, California has written one for you and it's 800 pages long. And there's 1,500 different things that happen to you in that instant. And if you haven't read the family code, you really don't know. And so that, that's why it's difficult. That's why it's complicated. That's why people really need competent, caring professionals to guide them through the process. I'm sure that that family code is uh, not quite a, a page turner. It's not, not really a coffee book table or co coffee table book. I, uh, I'm not recommending it as light reading. Maybe a good like bedtime story to kind of conk you out. <laughs> I do have a reading list on my website, Ron's reading list, the books that have profoundly changed my life. My grandfather told me when I was little, Ronnie, the only difference between you today and 20 years from now will be the books you read and the people you meet. And he was spot on. And so the books that have profoundly impacted me and changed my life are in Ron's reading list on the website. And the other thing I'd like them to know, anybody that's watching, is that I offer the most robust divorce toolkit on the internet. They can go into the Law Collaborative Divorce Toolkit and find seven drawers. They can see five to 15 tools in each drawer. All of the templates for uh, parenting planning in the Los Angeles County Superior Court. The guidelines, the uh, software for calculating child support and spousal support, and the mandatory financial forms that are required in California, we have mandatory reporting. Everything has to be disclosed and those financial forms can be found on our website. At the bottom of the landing page, it says divorce toolkit. Over there right now, just so I can show people, there's the divorce toolkit right there at the bottom. And of course, there's that link to the uh, divorce workshop as well. So again, you guys can get there by going to thelawcollaborative.com and scrolling to the bottom and there's that toolkit. Now, does that toolkit apply to people in and out of California or is that predominantly for people? And I'm, I'm assuming some of the things in there are probably for everybody, um, but are there some things that are California specific? It's all California law control. But I will tell you as a fellow in the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers, I travel to other states and talk to other lawyers. And what I find is it is more similar than it is different. Nine states 
have community property law, which is what we have in California. But the other uh, states have equitable distribution. So even though they don't call it community property, they really treat it in a much different way. The old English common law idea that women get nothing and everything belongs to men is gone with the wind. We now have equity throughout the country. So I'd say the tools you know, are mostly useful. Uh, you should always check with a lawyer in your jurisdiction if a legal question comes up. But keeping track of a parenting plan, keeping track of who pays what and how much is owed and what the expenses are, you know, that's everywhere. We all have to deal with uh, what is the cost of raising children? How much support uh, do we have to pay? In California, it's a crime not to support your children. You can go to jail and uh, you have to work to the best of your ability to earn as much as you possibly can to provide adequately for your children. Those are the legal requirements here. I'd be surprised if it's different in other states. Gotcha. That's, uh, yeah, great advice. Obviously, always talk to a competent attorney in your area. So any of our viewers outside of California, sorry, uh, you won't be able to work with Ron. <laughs> but if you're in California, uh, it doesn't sound like you could do much better. In a minute, I'm going to ask Ron a couple more questions. I'm going to ask him about his most memorable uh, case or cases, uh, as well as what he thinks maybe his biggest failure is, the, something that he learned the most from. Before we do that, I am going to read from our next sponsor, and our next sponsor is hundredsofcustomers.com and their Rocket SEO. Uh, hundredsofcustomers.com Rocket SEO. That's hundredcustomers.com slash rocket. And it's playing loudly in my ear and it may be playing in yours as well. <laughs> Are you a business owner uh, who knows that being on page one of Google is important, but who's afraid to work with an SEO company because you know that SEO is both expensive and slow? Well, not anymore. Rocket SEO from hundreds of customers forces you to page one of Google safely and legally through the power of the news media. National media campaigns that rank instantly boost your website's rankings inside of Google in one week or less with a very simple system that leverages the power of major media companies and network affiliates of ABC, NBC, CBS, and Fox all across the United States to put you on page one of Google in under a week, oftentimes repeatedly on the same page. You can simply visit hundredsofcustomers.com slash rocket. That's hundredsofcustomers, all spelled out, dot com slash rocket to learn more. All right. Uh, that's our last ad there. So, Ron, let me ask you then the questions I kind of led into on that, uh, that, that ad spot. What would you say is maybe one of your most memorable cases? One of the ones that kind of stuck with you, uh, you know, maybe, maybe it was a big failure, but maybe it was a big success. And you just all of a sudden something clicked and you're like, wow, this, I really understood something. You, it sounds like you have a lot of keen insight into human understanding, into human psychology and everything else. And I'm sure that that was built brick by brick, but what are some of those moments that really uh, shown in, in your life? I represented Harry Blackstone Jr. who in his lifetime was the greatest, most renowned, respected, admired magician on the planet. I knew the name. He was married to a former uh, ballet dancer. They had two little girls, but the wife had some very serious mental health issues. And I managed to get uh, custody of two little girls for Harry Blackstone. Uh, the next case that comes to mind was Monty Montana, who rode in the California Pasadena Rose Parade for 50 years. He wrote President Eisenhower in the box in the presidential inauguration parade and became the very famous uh, cowboy in California. He played uh, in, in several uh, movies and did rope tricks. He was a, an amazing writer. So when his second wife divorced him, she decided to go after his best trick, trick horse. He had a string of horses that he worked with, but Laramie was his favorite. Larry, he called him, and uh, she decided to claim that uh, it was her horse because he let her ride Laramie in the Rose Parade. He let her ride Laramie in the Rose Parade because she wasn't a rider, and he knew that Laramie would be the most gentle uh, horse for her to ride. But Marv Mitchelson, who at that time was maybe the most celebrated 
uh, divorce lawyer uh, in Southern California, uh, decided to represent her to take the horse away from Larry. And I learned very quickly that he was very enamored of the camera. And so we were on the cover of People magazine and we were in the newspapers and uh, journals. And I would always step aside and let Marv Mitchelson have the camera and Monty got the horse. Do um, you have time for one more story? We definitely have time for one more story. My most memorable case was the case involving the chiropractor who was making 200,000 a year, let his chiropractic license lapse. Then he was uh, an RN, which he had worked at to become a chiropractor. Then he let that license lapse. And now he's down to a, uh, a uh, two-year uh, certificated uh, nurse, a nurse's assistant, making about uh, 20 bucks an hour and claiming he couldn't earn enough money to protect his children. But he had a friend who was a makeup artist. And my uh, client went back to New England uh, with, to, to meet with her boyfriend, who she ultimately married. And uh, the child went with her to New England and came back and they hadn't been back a day or two. And he marched into court on an ex party application for urgent relief, claiming that the child had been beaten and bruised by the boyfriend in New England. And he had photographs of the little boy with all these terrible bruises on his legs, on his arms, on his torso. And uh, my client was just totally baffled because she'd never seen those bruises. She couldn't believe those bruises. And then a miracle happened. He was bragging to his girlfriend how he'd hired a makeup artist. He drugged the little boy so that the little boy was unconscious. And he had the makeup artist put all these bruises on the child's body, photographed them. And that's how he went in on his ex party. But the girlfriend was so appalled by the way he was treating this child that she secretly called me and told me what was going on. And I said, do you have a tape recorder? She says, I do. Are you sleeping with him? Yes, I am. Could you get him to brag to you about what he'd gotten away with? Because he had gone into court and gotten custody of the child. She got him talking. She tape recorded the conversation. And at the RFO that came up a few weeks later, I asked the judge if I could put a tape recorder on the bench uh, where he could hear it next to his microphone. And I put in the little cassette uh, recorder and played the uh, father bragging to the girlfriend about how stupid this judge was, how stupid her lawyer was, and how he tricked everybody. He was chained by the uh, bailiff and taken to jail straight from the courtroom. <laughs> my client regained custody. Wow. <laughs> it was on the front page of the Ventura paper uh, the next day. That's a crazy story. <laughs> oh man, that is, uh, I, I, I trust that the uh, girlfriend who recorded was fine in the end. Like that, that my, my initial thought is, gosh, I hope that nothing bad happened to her. Cause I can imagine him feeling, uh, quite betrayed, but, uh, Maybe if he's still locked away. Got out of town. Oh yeah, I was gonna say, that's a that's a that's a red flag right there. Uh, well, Ron, I don't want to keep you a whole lot longer. Um, I've already had you uh, basically for an hour here, and I've really enjoyed our time. Um, I feel like I could talk to you another two or three hours. I could probably just sit and listen to your stories. Um, and I'm I'm gonna say I I would imagine that uh, people who sign up for your webinar. Um, or people who join your, your, your webinar are probably going to hear some good stories and some good things. Um, before we go, why don't you give us uh, maybe just one or two of those tips you were, you were kind of hinting at before. You said you had your, your top 10 tips. Um, and then I'll let you uh, maybe leave us with a final word on, on the best places to find you, uh, social media, website, et cetera. Uh, and we'll go from there. So, so why don't you go ahead and start and uh, maybe let us know just uh, one or two of those tips to kind of wet the whistle. Well, I started that really uh, earlier when you asked me uh, how to get ready. Uh, have a plan, write a mission statement, write the family story, lawyer, uh, the family story, 
and find a lawyer who is familiar with the skills of consensual dispute resolution. You want a lawyer that's been in practice 20 or 30 years, who is trained as a mediator and who has sat in the superior court as a bench officer because they have a perspective that becomes very, very different. Don't blab. Keep your mouth closed. Do not go on social media. Don't say things on Facebook. Don't say things that are going to get you into trouble. My mother told me, don't say anything. Don't, don't write anything you wouldn't want me to read. I've changed that now to don't write anything you don't want a judge to read. Because <laughs> I got to tell you, the cases now come in with reams of uh, texts and emails. And uh, it's now a, against the law. It's a crime in California to say bad things about somebody on social media, to post nasty pictures of somebody on social media. They've added to the penal code uh, new crimes that have to do with the misuse of the uh, internet for the purpose of harassing, annoying, embarrassing, humiliating other people. So don't talk at work about it. Don't talk on the media about it. Get a therapist, get into therapy. There's a confidential relationship. They cannot disclose anything you say. Pick the right lawyer and have the lawyer and the therapist work together as your team to support you and guide you through a consensual reorganization of the family that is dignified, that is positive, from what you learn, use this as an, a learning opportunity. Master communication skills. There's a whole bunch of information on the internet um, about how uh, to become a masterful communicator and uh, conversationalist. Um, empathic communication, collaborative communication. There's a whole lot of information. Words that on my reading list, you'll find a book called Words Can Change Your Brain. There's a whole section in there about how to communicate in a more effective manner, which, which brings in consciousness. What I've been talking about this whole time is really a mindful, conscious approach to what may be the most traumatic event in your lives or in the lives of your children. A friend of mine just told me this morning in a conversation I was having, his 40-year-old son is still suffering the pains of the divorce when he was little and is talking to his father about it, you know, 30 years later. Yeah, I know divorce just affects everybody. I know that uh, my wife and I are both from broken family. I, I never knew my father, in fact, and she is from a divorced family. And just statistically, I've seen so many things about the this modern generation and, and how many of them are coming from broken families that are dealing with trauma and they're dealing with the the stress of it. Oftentimes, a lack of modeling for you know what does a, a healthy relationship even look like. Um, and I'm sure those are those are probably issues that a lot of people who come into your office are are working their way through as well, like like that gentleman. So, um, all right, well, Ron, that's about all I've got. I don't want to, again, I don't want to take up too much of your time. Um, really quickly though, why don't you close us out and uh, give yourself uh, one more one more plug for all of the different things that you're doing. And while we're doing that, I'm going to go ahead and uh, pull up your site one more time here. Um, so tell people uh, where they can find you and uh, you know why they should seek to work with the, the law collaborative there uh, in, in California. And obviously, as we discussed all throughout California now, <laughs> thanks to, thanks to the, the digital internet. California, if you're outside of California, look at the American Academy of Matrimonial Lawyers. They have chapters in almost all of the states. If you find a fellow in the AAML, they've been practicing more than 15 years, more than 50% of their practice is family law. And they've been uh, supported and endorsed by uh, both lawyers and judges. If you're in California, the Law Collaborative website is the most robust resource on the internet in terms of free tools, videos, audio workshops, um, things that you need to know, things that you need to learn. I do a workshop monthly on the second Saturday of each month 
10 to 12 Pacific time. And uh, it's open to the public, it's free. And uh, all questions are answered. It's anonymous, it's confidential. And uh, we try to assist and support families in a way that uh, helps them stay together as a family when the parents choose to live separately. All right. Well, I'm going to go ahead and end the, uh, end the conversation here, I guess. But Ron, thank you very much for making time with me. And uh, I would love to hear more from you. Uh, and in fact, down the road, maybe we can even have you back on the podcast again, because I think a lot of people are really going to resonate with this episode. Uh, I think a lot of people are really going to appreciate the insights that you had to share as well. So uh, I really enjoyed my time, but I just wanted to say uh, one more time, thank you very much. And again, if you guys are out there, uh, feel free to listen to or to, to, to visit thelawcollaborative.com. That's all spelled out, thelawcollaborative.com. So uh, that being said, I'm going to go ahead and end it here. But Ron, again, thank you very much. And for everyone else listening, you've been listening to The Attorney Post, your source for the inside baseball talk of all the things going on in the legal arena. You can visit us online at theattorneypost.com. And until next time, stay tuned. Bye-bye.